Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wafa El Sadr, and I'm honored and privileged uh, to be with all of you today and to uh, serve um, as the uh, director of Columbia World Project. And as many of you are aware, this is a unique initiative that is established now uh, four years ago at Columbia University with the purpose of taking knowledge and ideas to action with the goal of addressing the world's biggest challenges. So today's meeting is highly relevant to this and, um, and, um, and I hope that you will enjoy the presentation today at this annual meeting of the Adapting Agriculture to Climate Today uh, for Tomorrow, the Act Today project. At this event, you will have a wonderful opportunity to learn more about the exciting work that the team has accomplished over the past year. I'm very thrilled to, to share with you that ACT Today was actually the very first project to receive support from Columbia World Project, CWP. And, um, and again, and therefore in many ways, uh, this project, ACT Today, epitomizes the ethos and the principles that CWP is aiming to deliver on. Since 2017, ACT Today has been active in six countries around the world. And fundamentally the project aims to get innovative climate science information, methods, tools, and systems into the hands of those who need them uh, so that they can actually ensure safe and stable supplies of food. So I look forward to hearing the updates from the Act Today team. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce the founding dean of Columbia's Climate School, the director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University and a close friend of Columbia World Projects, Professor Alex Holliday. Alex? Hi, thank you very much, Wafa. Um, nearly five years ago, President Bollinger published a letter to the president, to the Columbia community, um, just asking people to consider how the university could better achieve what he called a fourth purpose. The first two purposes are obvious, research and education. And then there's something called service that most university academics get involved in as well. But this is a fourth purpose, which is about how to connect the university of the world to advance human welfare and confront the great challenges of our time. And this led to the creation of Columbia World Projects, which in only a few years is leading to important innovations in areas as varied as maternal health policy, COVID-19 vaccination, waste, water infrastructure, energy, and of course, climate. ACT Today is led by one of the climate school's key institutions, the International Research Institution for Institute for Climate and Society. Climate change um, is impacting the agriculture, productivity, and food security of many millions of people. And the climate school takes great, attaches great importance to the issues of both climate change and the consequent impacts of food security. Over the course of this week, I have participated in a number of Climate Week New York City events dealing with this very issue. So I know food security is front and center for many institutions, governments, leaders, etc. How to keep people well-fed, healthy, able to earn livelihoods, able to go to school, etc., is critical making sure they get the right kind of food is massively important. And right now, we don't have enough of the right kind of food getting to the, the people of the world. That's why ACT Today's work is so valuable and why it's so important that Columbia World Projects has supported it. So I'm now gonna to introduce to you uh, Walter Bethkin um, and uh, Walter along with Lisa Goddard is the lead of ACT Today. Uh, he's a senior research scientist at IRI and he spent decades working on and leading efforts to ensure that global development institutions such as the World Bank and USAID are able to use good science to inform climate related policy and development efforts. Over to you, Walter. Thank you, Alex. Good day, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, I believe, like Alex was saying, that finally we are realizing that tackling the world challenges need that we stop working in silos. World challenges like climate change, food security, ensuring good nutrition require that the scientific community break the silos and start working with transdisciplinary approaches. This is a, a key element in the fourth purpose that Columbia's President Lee Bollinger introduced that Alex just explained. And it is also one of the key principles of the new climate school. Now, 
Today you will hear several times that we talk about the IRI. This is, as Alex said, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society of the Columbia Climate School. And as its name indicates, the IRI has been connecting climate science with social challenges. About half of our researchers work in climate science and they interact under the same roof with the other half of our staff who are sector researchers, trying to use that climate knowledge to help solve challenges in agriculture, in food security, in public health, in energy, in natural ecosystems. And this is the reason why the IRI was asked to lead the first Columbia World Project, which Rafa introduced, and which we will discuss in this event. And of course, now in this new stage of the university, the IRI is thrilled with the opportunity to contribute to the new Columbia Climate School. Another term that you will hear several times in this event is climate services. Climate services are based on four pillars. One is the generation of the best possible climate knowledge. The second pillar is the translation of that climate knowledge into knowledge that is understandable and useful for the people who work in agriculture, in public health, in nutrition. So one, generate climate knowledge, two, translate it into something useful. A third pillar of the climate services is interacting with the people that are making actual decisions or elaborating policy. And this may be in a Ministry of Agriculture, in an international development organization, or in a farm. And ensure that the climate knowledge can be used to inform those decisions and policies. And finally, a fourth pillar in the climate services approach is the actual use of that translated knowledge. So, when you hear in this event the term climate services, remember that it includes the whole process, generating, translating climate knowledge, transferring it to the right stakeholders, and actually using it in decisions, in plans, and in policies. Our project, Act Today, was established to use climate services in six developing countries to contribute to achieve food security improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. These are very ambitious goals for a project. And today we are happy to say that we have very compelling, successful stories to share with you. For example, last year in Senegal, President Macky Sall increased the agriculture budget by 50% to buy agriculture input, like good seeds or fertilizers. And the reason why he made that decision was that he based, he was based on information provided by the National Meteorological Institute, one of our main partners in Senegal, that indicated that the crop growing season was expected to be favorable. And as a result, Senegal had a record harvest and did not need to import any food. And let me remind you that Senegal is a country that very often has to import significant proportions of the food they consume. Another example is the work that ACT Today is conducting with collaboration, in collaboration with international organizations, such as the World Food Program, to develop innovative insurance products. Now, those insurance products are now reaching millions of small farmers in some of the ACT Today countries. And this insurance is allowing farmers to invest in the technologies that they know they need to produce more food. But that sometimes they're afraid to buy, fearing that they may get a bad growing season. Now, Act Today was able to achieve these results because it identified and addressed some key challenges that may prevent governments to integrate climate knowledge into food policy and decision making. Our presenters today, Tufa Dinku, Angel Munoz, and Melody Brown, will talk about the ways that our project addressed three of these challenges. 
After the presentations, we will have a Q&A session and I'll be joined by Wafa, Alex, and our three presenters. So now for the presenters. Let me remind you that ACT Today's goal is to help fight hunger with improved climate services in our three countries. So first we will hear from Tufa Dinku. He's going to address our first challenge that we commonly face in this type of projects. And that is that in order to establish good climate services, countries need good climate data. And many countries in the developing world often have significant gaps in climate data. So Tufa is going to tell us why that matters and what we're doing about that in our project act today. So Tufa, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, so let's talk about uh, uh, climate data poverty and what the uh, IRA has been uh, trying to do uh, to alleviate this problem. So uh, climate <coughs> data poverty is about uh, limited or no uh, historical uh, climate records. So it, it's not just IRI uh, talking about uh, climate data poverty. For example, here is an <coughs> article from Bloomberg uh, describing the challenge <coughs> in Africa. There is also very good uh, graphics here, a map showing uh, distribution of stations across uh, the globe. These are uh, weather climate observation stations across the globe, and each dot represents um, a station. So red areas means a good number of stations, white areas means no or small stations. So if you just compare West uh, Europe and Africa, you can see uh, a big difference. A recent article showed that the number of stations in Germany are more than the number of stations in the whole of Africa combined. And by the way, these countries are also those affected by climate change and actually will need this data uh, to understand and deal with climate change. So this is kind of a double uh, injustice for, for these countries. So <clears throat> IRI has been working around the world uh, in many countries with many national MS services and we have been looking at, okay, what are the main causes, uh, at least the major ones. Uh, here are some examples. So this is uh, a graphics showing the number of stations reporting in the vertical axis and the years in the horizontal axis. And you can see here that uh, observations in Rwanda almost halted in 1993, 1994 during the genocide in Rwanda. And it took Rwanda over 15 years to come back to the pre-genocide uh, side. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and this is not just Rwanda. This kind of things happen uh, everywhere where there are conflicts. For instance, uh, there has been conflict in the northern part of Ethiopia for the last 10 months. That means in many places there have not been uh, observations. The other challenge is uh, the decrease in investment uh, in uh, station network by the government. This is an example uh, from Madagascar. But these are just two countries and two examples, but we can also have a look at Africa-wide. This shows the number of stations uh, that have been available for many applications around the globe. And you can see a very drastic uh, decline. Now, why do we care about climate data, about historical records? Because any climate service, a country, a national climate service provides will depend on the number and quality of the observation. So good data, good observation is a good, for, uh, a good foundation for good climate services. No data or poor data is going to be a bad foundation for uh, climate services. And as an example, uh, for example, uh, here around New York, there was heavy rainfall yesterday, last, last, last night. Uh, was that normal? I mean, was that expected? How would you know? You have to compare it like uh, to a uh, historical record of over 30 years. You even want to know, okay, is this, uh, this, uh, this kind of 
heavy rain been uh, happening before. So you have to look back even further, right? 40, 50 years to understand is this something new? Is this something that happens uh, around here? Uh, and in Africa, a farmer would like to know, okay, how the climate changed, changed the onset and the session of the season. So for all this kind of, to answer all this kind of question, and more, you need historical data at least of uh, 30, 40 years of data. So what have IRM been doing? So uh, what do we do at IRI? is to go to a country and work with the national image services and help, help them fill historic, uh, both temporal and spatial gaps in the climate of the region. Here's an example from Ethiopia. So on the left, you will see all those dots are station locations in Ethiopia. The colors show rainfall amount. So blue is low rainfall and red is uh, high rainfall. On the right side, you see satellite rainfall estimates, which are freely available globally. And the advantage of satellite rainfall estimate is that it covers the whole of the country, actually it covers almost the whole of the world. The satellites do not measure rainfall, right? It's an estimate as any estimates, uh, it involves errors. So now can we combine the strength of the station, which is good quality, but uh, doesn't cover everywhere with the satellite data, which covers everywhere, but is not as a crest station observation. So what we do, we help countries create hybrid data set, which is not perfect, but combines the two strengths of uh, these two different observations. With this, we can now help the country create uh, over 40 years of uh, spatially and temporally complete uh, climate data sets. Uh, and that was Ethiopia, but we have been doing this in, in, this in uh, other uh, actually countries, as well as many other countries uh, uh, across Africa and other regions. So uh, <clears throat> just <clears throat> one example, one good example of uh, this, this kind of data, the, applica the application of this kind of data. Here is a tool that is being developed for Ethiopia under Act Today in collaboration with uh, national institutions. Uh, this is a tool for scenario analysis, for planning, and for advising farmers uh, what to do to in order to get good yield uh, for a given season. So what does the tool do? So it combines climate data and uh, agronomic information in a crop modeling uh, environment. Uh, it could be used to calculate uh, optimal dates of planting. So if I plant one week early, one, one week late, given the rainfall, would, what would be the yield? Uh, and of course, uh, the, prof the, the ag professional staff can use also use this information to do some sort of what if scenario. If I put this much uh, soil, I have this soil, if I put this much uh, fertilizer with this amount of rainfall, what will be the yield? And based on that, the ag professionals can now advise the farmers when to plant, where to plant, what um, fertilizer to apply, when to apply. Now, so what is the advantage of the data here is that <clears throat> uh, you can do these simulations you can only where you have climate data. So if you remember, if you look back at the station distribution, it's the other one I showed you, you can only do this at those uh, locations which cover only part of the country. But with this data, which is available every four kilometers across Ethiopia now, you can do this simulation for any part of Ethiopia and advise the farmers in any part of Ethiopia. So that's one example of uh, the application of this data, but of course there are many. Okay, thank you for your attention and have a good day. Okay. Thank you very much, Tufa. So Tufa has shown how Act Today worked to solve a first critical challenge, that of data poverty, ensuring that our countries have good records of climate. We know that good science is needed to inform policy, but you cannot do good science without good data. Now, we would like now to play a short video message from one of our closest partners in this project and a very dear friend of the IRI. 
the director of Senegal's Meteorological Institute, Anasim. Challenges for the National Weather Service is to be able to provide climate information services in the whole country, and for that we need accurate data everywhere. And this collaboration with the projects allow us to have data, to access data, and to be able to produce all our information that we need for different sectors in the countries. Well, it's always very nice to see Usman. Now, remember that our project is about connecting climate to food security. And more specifically, it's helping to adapt agriculture to climate today for tomorrow. In other words, a premise of our work is that improving the adaptation of societies to climate that they face today, that they face right now, including the droughts, the floods, the heat waves, is a good strategy for improving the adaptive capacity to future climate. This idea of adapting to climate year by year to build long-term adaptation has been at the very core of the IRI work since its beginning. Now, Angel Muñoz is now going to explain how we have applied this in our project in Act Today. So please, Angel, go ahead. Hello. As you know, my name is Angel, and I'm representing the Latin American component of the Act Today project. I'm going to be talking to you about a short-term adaptation to build long-term resilience. As you probably know, Act Today has been implementing a new culture in the work of adaptation to climate change. We will resilience to a change, changing climate by implementing actions to improve the adaptation to today's climate, as opposed to trying to target only the long term, which is most of what has been done in the last 20 years. Our colleague Tufa talked about the importance of uh, a foundation of solid climate data. What becomes possible when that foundation is in place? Well, we can build better forecast systems, more robust tools to analyze and visualize trends, identify risk areas in time and space. And these new services are immediately useful to help governments design short-term adaptive strategies that are the basis for long-term resilience. Why do we take this approach? Here is part of a plot that shows a climate variable like rainfall, you can see that in the, in the vertical axis, over time for a given uh, location in the world. On the far right of this, we see what's happening in the long term, for example, the end of this century. Even if we have a good idea about what will happen to rainfall in this area 50 to 100 years from now, does that mean that we should plan for this scenario? When we analyze the entire picture for all years, not only for the long-term future, but also the near term and the next few years, we can see that the red line, which is related to the climate change signal, is not letting us see that in certain years, we can have far more or far less rainfall than expected, as I'm showing in these blue circles here. So this red line here, in brief, is what we expect if we follow the climate change projections. But what we actually can miss is that in some of those particular years, we might have some droughts or even like more rainfall that we expect if we only use that long-term climate information. So getting only ready for what might happen at the end of the century could lead to miss key opportunities to adapt to events in any particular year. So when countries are better able to anticipate and plan for current climate, to uh, threats for, to, for uh, food security, they are better prepared to confront future climate risks. But how do we do that? Well, we act today. We build effective climate services to build adaptation today. We have been implementing this new culture in the work of adaptation to climate change. So we build resilience to a changing climate by implementing actions that improve the adaptation to today's climate. What do we need to help implement those actions? Best possible information, as our colleague Tufa discussed, leading to boosting capacities in national institutions, for example, to have better climate forecasts, but also helping sectors to use that climate information. And 
buy-in of all those institutions to use the act today approach. That is what is happening through our collaborative work in Guatemala, Colombia, and well beyond that. And we work directly with our national meteorological and hydrological services, with our coffee federations, Colombia Rice Federation, the World Food Programme, the agroclimatic roundtables co-developed with the SEAT Biodiversity Alliance and many, many other partners. The Act Today approach is so successful that it is now being suggested as an international standard by the World Meteorological Organization. The skills we are building uh, with our partners um, are definitely going to help them in the long run as well. These new systems and methodologies benefit not just people working on food security, but all sectors, what we know as climate services ecosystems, and is not only helping the six original Act Today countries, but well beyond them, as for example, has been happening during the last year in all Central American countries. This is how we implement short-term adaptation to guarantee long-term resilience. This is how we act today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Angel. Now, what Tufa and Angel had talked about is mainly the, the climate side of our work. Tufa talked about the challenges of improving climate data, and Angel emphasized the need to adapt to climate today to improve the adaptive capacity to future climate. But the best data and the best climate forecast are not going to mean anything if that knowledge is not fully integrated into actual policy, into operational decision making, into preparedness and response. Which brings us to the last challenge that we want to talk about today. And that's about the use and sustainability. A lot of the climate information generated by national climate and weather institutions it's often communicated in ways that are not very useful or they are not easy to integrate into actual, real decision making. And even when it is, sometimes staff at agricultural ministries or other potential users of climate knowledge often lack the understanding and the capacity to optimize the use of that information for decision making. So our next presenter, Melody Brown, is going to show us what Act Today is doing to bring this, these two sides together, the providers of climate information and those who use that information so that each can understand the other's needs and capabilities. But first, let's watch another short video message from one of our international collaborators, the World Food Programme. Hi, my name is Krishna Krishnamurti. I work with the World Food Program in Panama, supporting the work on climate services in Latin America and the Caribbean. We've been working with IRI on ACT Today for several years. It's been an exciting program that has enabled us to really enhance the climate service capabilities in the field. For example, in Guatemala, we've had a really interesting project where we worked with the National Med Service and IRI to transfer the knowledge on the latest generation of climate models to the stage that basically the government now runs the models themselves and that has really enabled new opportunities really game-changing opportunities for uh, anticipating and preparing better for hazards so i'm really looking forward to more uh, opportunities like this in the near future thank you so please realize that by by partnering with institutions like the world food program we're partnering with an institute that is working every year with 80 million people, spending $80 million to try to solve uh, food security situations around the world. So let us now hear from Melody. Thank you, Walter, and hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. So with previous speakers, we have seen the importance of developing good quality data at relevant timescale, but how do we connect that with policies and practice in the countries that we work in? We're facing two main challenges that are preventing a good use of climate information. 
First, we're seeing that climate information providers, such as the National Meteorological Services that Tufa and Angel talked about, and the climate information users, who are anybody making decisions that can be affected by weather events, so the Ministry of Agriculture, farmers, private sector, those two groups tend to work in silo and not really interact too much. And that's often because they don't understand each other. As a result, we have a lot of potentially useful information that is being produced, but that remains unused. The second challenge we're seeing is that many products and capacity building programs are developed in a top-down manner where scientists are developing a tool or a curriculum that is based on the data that they have or their own understanding of the problem, but without involving the users. So that doesn't work very well because it lacks ownership and sustainability and is often just missing the point. On the pictures is what we want to see happen and what we're fostering through ACT today. On the first picture, you can see brainstorming between practitioners about the climate impacts that they're facing and the climate information that they need. And on the second picture, you can see them interact with scientists from the meteorological departments. So to address this first challenge, we come to one of the Act Today's innovations. We have leveraged the interdisciplinarity within IRI and worked with partners to develop academies of climate services that are creating opportunities for interdisciplinary dialogue um, through workshops and events and trainings. It is offering user-centered capacity building and it is promoting the development of new collaboration between those users and providers of climate information. The Bangladesh Academy for Climate Services was the first academy to be launched in 2018, and it's described by someone from the Bangladesh Meteorological Department as removing the darkness on climate services. Over the past few years, it has contributed to the development of the first climate service for aquaculture, the integration of climate services into a master's program on adaptation, and it has fostered new partnerships, for example, with the United Nations on the use of climate information in a Rohingya refugee camp. Because of ACT Today, we were not only able to uh, develop this initiative in Bangladesh, but also expand it to other ACT Today countries and beyond. So now we have national academies in Colombia, Guatemala, and Ethiopia. We have discussions underway in Senegal and Vietnam, and we have conducted 41 trainings on climate services that have reached 691 participants across ACT Today in just a few years. We have new university curricula in several countries, and we are now working on a new global academy model that will support coordination and collaboration between the national academies that will promote learning and sharing, and that will potentially lead to the development of new curriculums um, jointly developed. So we have talked about how the academies help address this disconnect between users and providers, and now let's talk about that second challenge, which is including the users in the development of climate services. So I'll give you an example of how we do that through the work that ACT Today has done on index insurance. So as you know, farmers have many options to manage climate impact and increase their food production. They can choose different crop varieties, they can adjust planting and harvesting time, they can diversify inputs. But some climate impacts are just too severe to be managed by those strategies. And just one severe bad year can have long lasting consequences on food security. For example, if a farmer has to sell their land because they lost all of their crop. Traditional crop insurance is typically too expensive for farmers and not very well developed in many countries. As a result, another type of insurance called index insurance was developed. So instead of providing a payout on the basis of an assessment of the losses, which insurance typically does, it's based on the measurement of a weather variable that we know is strongly correlated with crop losses. And this variable, such as rainfall, for example, can be measured using uh, satellite data or using local weather station, but it's very important that it's using good quality data. And uh, when the amount of rainfall during critical stages of the crop cycle fall below or above a pre-identified threshold, farmers who purchase the insurance automatically get compensated. So it doesn't require farmers to file a claim or insurance companies to measure losses. And as a result, it has significantly lowered the transaction costs and the premium of the products. That has allowed millions of farmers to get access to insurance. So by providing a safety net, it allows farmers to recover faster during a bad year, but also invest in more resilient, more productive climate strategies during good year, uh, which really supports food security in the long term. Successful products are those that put farmers at the center of the process and that are based on good quality data that match farmers' experience. 
Uh, for example, on the pictures, you can see farmers working together to identify key times of the season and uh, past years that were really bad for them. And we use that to ensure that the insurance products that are developed are really providing a payout when farmers need it. It's also critical that products are transparent and that farmers fully understand what the insurance covers or not. Another key to success is to transfer the capacity to design robust insurance products to local stakeholders. And we're not the only ones to say that because in the words of one of our partners from the World Food Program, Act Today has helped us to create the conditions for a major scale up in these countries by giving local insurance experts the capacity to design insurance products that are tailored to their area of coverage. This was an essential step that allowed us to expand into new regions and reach much bigger numbers of participants. And indeed, projects that we support through Act Today are now providing insurance coverage to 950,000 people in Ethiopia, 525,000 people in Senegal, and 350,000 in Bangladesh. So this is a typical example of how we use good quality climate information to improve the food security of farming communities by putting them at the center of the process, helping them understand the data, include them in the design of the products that they will purchase. And also it's a good example of how a relatively small institution like the IRI with the right partnerships can reach millions of farmers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meloy. Thank you very much. And thanks very much to the three presenters uh, for sharing these great experiences. So now we will first hear back from the leadership of the Climate School and the Columbia World Projects, and then we will get some questions from for our speakers. So I would like to invite Wafa and Alex to give your initial thoughts on what you just heard. Wafa. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Walter, for the opportunity. And uh, first, I want to, of course, congratulate Uh, for the progress that has been achieved over the past year uh, in, 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 in all the domains as well as all the countries where ACT Today is working. Um, I think it's, uh, as I step back and think about CWP and, um, and why it's, uh, uh, it is so committed to ACT Today, I think because the project really brings, um, it adheres to some of the core principles uh, at CWP. And one of them is, of course, the, uh, the diversity of the expertise, the interdisciplinarity of the individuals who are involved in this, uh, in this project, the amazing partnerships that uh, the project has built over the years and the diversity of partnerships. And I know how tough that is to engage governmental, non-governmental community groups. And, uh, and, to, and to sustain that engagement is also very evident uh, from the presentation. And then I think, again, another element that's so uh, uh, very close to my heart is the, the commitment to measurement, the commitment to actually demonstrating progress, to, uh, to uh, demonstrating the critical outputs and so on from this project. Um, and I think that, that these, and, and, and then for fundamentally, of course, is ultimately the goal of this project is really to take data and, uh, and use the data. And it's at the core of CWP, at the core of the fourth purpose and so on. Uh, so it's, it's really is rather remarkable how there's such amazing uh, alignment between uh, what the project is doing as well as also what CWP aims to do and its aspirations for this project and beyond. Alex? Yeah, I, I was really struck by those presentations. So thank you so much for um, letting me, part of, me be part of this. I was, uh, I've always been a fan of IRI and it's partly because the... Um, the Earth Institute has been basically built around the IRI model of taking top quality research and translating it into real action and uh, relevance to communities. I was, there are some other things that came out of this presentation, these presentations that really struck me. One was the um, very clear way in which you're getting a mixture of, um, you're, you're, you're dealing with this top down thing and actually building some kind of engagement that is a mixture of bottom up and top down, which is so important because it's very clear that when academics typically think about climate problems, they think about, they think about you know, they're the ones providing the solutions or they're the ones coming up with the model. And actually what we don't do enough of is actually engage with communities about what's really going on and what they need. 
to provide powerful information that uh, uh, produces change. The second thing I thought was that really struck me was the innovation side and the, in the insurance is a good example. Um, the education things you're doing, th th that's really impressive because you're coming up with new products that could actually make a difference. And so this new idea of index insurance, I thought was fantastic. Um, and I think the, the third thing that struck me as um, really remarkable was the scale up and that what you're doing, because it doesn't sound like a small organization, like a, with all due respect, small but important organization like IRI. Uh, nonetheless, it doesn't strike me on how can you have a global impact and I think what you're doing is actually working with specific countries. You're achieving massive impact and people are taking notice, including the, you know, the government of Ethiopia or whatever. And um, that actually is sort of clearly having a big impact. And then people are saying, well, we need to scale this up. And so it was quite striking to hear about the way uh, we're actually getting uh, the WMO on board with actually providing something on a bigger scale going forward and the, the stuff that's developing across Central America was really impressive. So it, it sort of ticked a lot of boxes for me uh, about how we actually take, you know, great research in a place like Colombia and actually manage to take that to a bigger stage. I, I thought I'd go on and actually ask you, you Walter, and, and uh, Wafa some questions, because now I've got the floor, I've got such power. So I thought uh, this would be a good chance to maybe ask, kick off by asking Wafa uh, about ACT Today and how it, really, how it really embodies the mission of Columbia World Projects, um, and particularly in the area of climate science, I guess. I was wondering if you could get your, your view on that. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Alex, and um, and I'll start. And and I, I do think, as I mentioned, I think that the the, the core principles and that that Act Today is really centered uh, Act Today is really centered on are exactly the same ones that CWP is centered on: the interdisciplinarity, the partnerships, the um, uh, as well as the focus on outputs and uh, the engagement of communities. And I, the, I think all of these are very important uh, to us at CWP, as you're well aware. In addition, of course, as you uh, are, uh, as many of you are aware, we at CWP are cognizant that climate and climate effects and climate change um, has deep impact on the diversity of other uh, areas of, uh, of life. I mean, in addition to food security, which is the focus of this uh, project specifically, but uh, we know that it has an impact on um, mobility and displacements uh, within countries, on con peace versus conflict, on uh, public health, um, and in addition, of course, on economic security and so on. So I think what we, um, and that's the reason why we at CWP are very committed uh, to, um, to building on this uh, project and, uh, and uh, have, are engaged in several other projects at different phases of development. We're focusing on energy use and clean energy, for example, in two of our projects. And uh, we're about to embark on a collaborative uh, effort uh, uh, between uh, CWP, the Global Centers at Columbia University and the Climate School. So um, we wanna build and continue these deep connections uh, as we move forward. Yeah, that's wonderful, great. So Walter, maybe I could ask you a couple of questions. Um, so we this act today is fantastic. It's, done amazing things in the, these first uh, in, well, nearly five years. Um, what's going to happen next? Where can this work go from here? And, and how do you see, it, see a, a sort of act today too, as it were? Or so, maybe not, maybe your job is done, which you just close it all down. So. No, no way. So uh, our plan is to, to establish new projects like, like act today in other developing countries and take advantage of these great partnerships that you and Wafa were mentioning that we have been establishing for a long time, especially international institutions. So the nice thing of fact today is we're working very heavily with the national government, with the national institutes, but we're also connecting to international partners, very important international partners. For example, we have been working for more than 10 years with the CGIAR, which mm -hmm. is the only agriculture research institute that works in the entire development world. So embedding our work in climate services in the CGIR agenda allows us to work with the entire developing world. 
And, and we have similar partnership with other key institutions like the FAO, like the World Food Program, like the International Federation of the Red Cross. But also, and, and very importantly, very exciting for us, we are now part of the climate school. So now we can bring on board nutritionists, public health specialists, sociologists, economists. So very exciting plans for the future, Alex. So what do you think will be the, the last, so get back to ACT today and, and what you're doing. What do you think are gonna be the lasting impacts of what you, I mean, it was just brilliant to hear from, uh, you know, Tufa and from, um, of course, from uh, Aniel and, um, and Melody. Uh, these are fantastic examples that they're sort of, I feel that they're sort of jewels in the crown as it were, but, you know, I just wonder if the crown is gonna keep going or is it gonna fall apart as soon as the, as soon as we we stop what's are, are yeah. you gonna have are these countries gonna be able to really sustain what you've got going or do yes you think we think so. We, think so we look we have been working a lot with national institutes in all the six countries We're working with institutes that are working in climate others that are working in agriculture interacting with extension agencies of the countries and we have also been collaborating with local universities and, and so this ensures that after the project, we leave these capacities strengthened in the countries, their own capacity strengthened, so that this institution can continue doing this type of work. And we, we also hope that another legacy of ACT today is that we hope that we are contributing to establish this culture of collaboration between institutions, this breaking the silos to demonstrate the power of, of co-creation of participatory approaches that Melody was mentioned. So, so here again, I am very optimistic about the lasting impacts of our project. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question, Alex. Uh, okay. So how, how do you think that this type of work that you know, we heard from, from Tufa, from Angel, from Melody, how does that fit in the broader mission of the new Columbia Climate School? Well, I think a lot of people, I mean, that's a really good question. I, I mean, and the answer is it, it fits absolutely squarely in the mission of the Climate School. Um, people think about climate change in terms of you know, the long-term change that's, that are happening with climate, of course, uh, that are brought as a result of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and of course, that's massively important and trying to figure out what's going to happen in those, if those long terms are, are really interesting. But I think there's, there, there are two things that strike me as uh, very important. There's natural variability that, of course, relates to El Nino, et cetera, which you're working on, which needs to be one of the most important things that actually really does uh, lead to more, um, if you like, a more granular uh, focus on, on what's going on. But the other thing I was, you know, I was looking at what um, Annual showed uh, that trend over time of you know looking at long-term changes in climate but also those big swings and the question i guess everyone's got is what's going to happen to those big swings whether they're caused by el nino or whatever if you've got an underlying trend from climate change and i think most people actually think these extremes could be far worse whether it's el nino type things or whether it's just uh, variability caused by uh, more natural, uh, longer other other variations that are causing, for example, drought in the Western U.S. or etc. So I think understanding the interplay between long-term climate change and short-term climate variability is going to be huge because it's actually going to make a, a massive impact on developing countries in particular. I mean, we worry about what's happening in the Western U.S., which is pretty disastrous. Um, but you know, this is nothing compared to what's going to happen in the tropics. And we have to get our heads around how do we really provide much better prediction and um, climate services for um, people who are going to be in developing countries where they're going to see huge impacts going forward. So that part of, you know, the adaptation strategy for climate change, I think, has to be very closely interplayed with, with the work you've been doing. And we see the way you work as from actually perfect. So like, and some of the top climate scientists in the world that I know, you know, distinguished fellows of the Royal Society or whatever, they talk about IRI and what you're doing as the best thing out there in terms of trying to sort of 
I know I'm saying that because I'm Colombia, of course. But, you know, the fact is that there's these are people who are not Colombia. And they're saying that this is um, this is an example of the kind of exactly the kind of thing we need to be doing in terms of taking climate science and actually translating it to adaptation strategies on the ground. So we have to build on what you're doing and, and strengthen it going forward. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you, Wafa. I, I am conscious of the time, and I know that you, Alex, and Wafa may have to leave at 12 sharp. So, but I thank goodness we have time to answer a few questions from the audience. And I'll, I'll start by asking in the same order that we had the speaker. So, Tufa, there is a question for you. Um, there, the question is, there are other products available at global scale that link climate information and satellite information. What is different of the work that you are conducting in ACT today? Too far. Uh, thanks for the question. I think that is actually a very good question in terms of, yes, there are other products that combine satellite and, and station data, which are actually globally available. I can name many of those. And what's the main difference? The main difference is because we work with the national MS services, we have access to more station data. For example, in Ethiopia, Ethiopia shares with the world about 17 stations every day. So anybody around the world can have access to about 17, 170 stations every single day. But uh, the national MS service collects from about 150 stations every single day. So because we work with them, we have no access to 150. So the 150 are operational. But there are also stations that send like reports on papers, through mail at the end of the year. Those are close to a thousand stations. So now we can work with them, clean those stations and add those stations satellite data. So now because this, uh, the product we work with have more stations, they have uh, much better quality than those available globally. Great. Thank you, Tufa. I'm going to jump quickly to another question now for Angel. Angel, could you say a bit more about how the forecast information matches the decisions that farmers or others are making? I think when he says climate forecast, he's talking about a forecast looking forward a few months, not decades. Is that right? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Walter, for the question. And it's uh, closely related to what Alex uh, <clears throat> and everyone else was uh, mentioning before. But in particular, Alex was talking about, you know, the, the approach that we use in terms of um, focusing on multiple timescales. So our forecasts are not just produced by the best models that we have. They are demand driven. So that means that we actually go and identify what is the concrete demand that farmers in this case have and how to actually respond to that uh, with concrete products that are not only climate forecast at um, the next few days, time scales, or the next few weeks, or the next few months, but we provide a bridging, a continuous, uh, we provide cross time scale forecasts because we know, we have been learning through these 28 years of experience in our work at the IRI that the decision makers can uh, do their job if they have information at these multiple time scales. And as I just said, the work that we do at the IRI goes well beyond forecasting climate. We already saw several examples in terms of contextualizing information. Tufa was talking about that. And Melody also explained uh, a few of these uh, financial tools that we have to transfer risk. But we can also forecast things like crop yields, or now we're doing even like a uh, forecast of undernutrition for kids under five in Central America. So we can actually target, we can provide information that obviously uses climate information at multiple time scale, but goes well beyond that to actually answer the concrete demand. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Angel. I have one question for Melody now, and, uh, and then I have a, a, a few other questions that I think I can group in one. So Melody, how, Typical is it that decision makers do not work closely with meteorological services? You would think that as important as it is, this information for managing agriculture, health, etc., they would have strong ties. Does IRI really need to help bring these groups together? 
Thank you, Walter. That's a good question. Uh, yes, it's it's actually very common that decision makers don't interact so much with uh, meteorological departments. And really, when, when you look at reports like the last IPCC report, those are reports that have a lot of visibility and sometimes a lot more than, than shorter timescale of climate information in each of the countries. So what we see is that a lot of decision makers, including people working on adaptation to climate change, are using long-term climate information to, to inform their decisions. Um, but they're not necessarily aware that there's other types of information available or they don't necessarily know how to find it and how to access it. And then that's often because the, the meteorological departments tend to be smaller, less funded parts of the, of the ministries. And so they don't have huge teams. They don't have huge, huge resources. And so really their mandate is to produce climate information, but they don't have the capacity to translate it into every possible sector. So there's a gap in between uh, and that's why there's a big need for intermediaries that are able to translate the needs on the ground, the actual needs that decision makers have based on, you know, the choices that they have to make and the type of climate information that's available uh, and that can help meet those needs. And so there's this gap in the middle and that's where IRI is working. We're, you know, trying to bridge this gap and that's where we do need help. We're trying to, you know, work with different types of local partners to build their capacity as intermediaries as well. Uh, but yeah. There's definitely more work needed and more help needed. Great. Great, thanks. So I'm aware that we are about one minute uh, to get to the end of this event, but um, we'll stay for a few more minutes because there's a lot of nice, good questions coming for everybody. And, and one group of questions that, you know, being asked by Yannick Joseph, by Stephanie Bord, by Fernanda Sermoglio, they all are asking basically the same question, which, which is great to hear. And is, do we have plans to extend, to expand Act Today in the next years to other countries? One country mentioned is Haiti. And of course, the ambition is yes. The ambition is to, to, to use the great experiences, the great lessons that we learned in Act Today and seek for support and, and connect to the right partners to expand Act Today to many other countries. That, that, is, a, that is, of course, the ambition. And we are very optimistic that, that we will be able to do that. And, and I would say, especially now that the IRI is part of the Climate School. So I think that strengthening the collaborations that we have with organizations like USAID, like the World Bank, like UN system, uh, with the private sector, we, we really believe that we will have the chance to expand this wonderful work to many other countries. So I'm trying to check. There is one more question for Melody. Uh, sorry, let me try to find it. And um, it says, why? Do you emphasize, I think Alex talked a little bit about this, but why do you emphasize concepts like participatory approach, co-creation, etc.? What, what is so important about that? Well, what's so important about that is that when it doesn't happen, we have products that don't really solve the problems that we're seeing on the ground. So very often, um, you know, decision makers have very specific questions that they're trying to answer. And if they're not involved in the development of climate products, uh, usually the products end up not answering those questions or they end, up, they end up not being adapted. So I think there's, yeah, there's also really a movement of a lot of people now on the ground who, who work on the ground who are saying, you know, we're fed up with people coming to us and saying, here's what you're going to do. Here's how you're going to do it. Like they, they know what they need. They know what they want. And they just want to be part of developing the solutions um, that, you know, to the problems that they're facing. So I think it's, um, you know, development has been for many, many years, a very top-down um, approach, you know, has used very top-down approaches and, and that needs to change because we see that it's just not, uh, it's not efficient. So, yeah, I, I think um, we've just seen through climate services, through index insurance, through the different projects that we've been involved in that, the only way to really develop something that's useful is to involve the people that are ultimately going to use it. Great. Well, thank you. There is a, so I think that we should, let's stay until five minutes past the hour. 
um, we're getting more questions. There is a, a question from, from Ethiopia. So, hello, my name is Teofolus Kirmani, and I am a senior high school student in Ethiopia. In my country, the agriculture and the food supply is highly dependent on traditional approach. Therefore, we are vulnerable for potential famine. Can you please elaborate on a modern approach of agriculture, taking in mind the current climate change in order to have more product? This is, this is a very good question, and I'm really happy that a young person is asking this question. Uh, I think what, what we have been finding in the IRI, what we have been also doing in ACT today, is that we have to concentrate when we think about the impacts of climate change on agriculture in places like Ethiopia, but around the world, is we have to concentrate in what climate change is doing to extremes, to the events that are really affecting food production, that are really threatening food security. And so this is why Angel was stressing, was emphasizing so much. What can we do today to improve the resilience of our agriculture production system? Now, in cases like Ethiopia, the other very important issue is that small farmers are very worried, are very uh, afraid of investing in the technologies that they know they need to produce more food. And they, they're, it, it makes sense that they're scared. They're scared because if they invest in those technologies and then they get a bad season, they may end losing the farm. So the combination that we need in places like Ethiopia and in all the developing world is a combination that is, what can we do with technologies to reduce the impacts of climate variability of climate extreme events? And we know that we will not be able to reduce, to manage all the risks. And the risks that we cannot manage, we have to find ways to transfer, for example, with accessible insurance. So the combination that we are pushing is a combination of best possible information, adequate technology, and financial tools like insurance to transfer the risk that we cannot manage. Well, we reached five minutes after the hour. We, we are saving the questions that we had from the audience and we will find a way to respond to them. So I would like to thank, first of all, thank Wafa and Alex for participating in this event, our three great presenters and all the people behind the scenes that have been working to organize this event. And of course, thank to all of you in the audience for being part of this. Have a good day.